All right, so, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to get the sign-in sheet passed around. Um, there's still a few of you that didn't get homework assignments for homework number four or five, which is it? Four. four. Okay. Um, so get if you haven't gotten one, get one. That's due on Friday. Um, okay. All right. Um, I got the sign-in sheet passed around. Let's let's talk a little bit about where we left off and where we're headed. So last time we finished T beams, and there's really n nothing left to say on T beams. But we we started doubly reinforced. We didn't quite get to any examples. So I want to talk about that today. So first off, again, if you're actually purposefully, um, you know, if you're needing to put compressive reinforcement into a beam, you've either got some significant depth or architectural restrictions or something like that, or there's something wrong with your beam design. Now that being said, if that rebar is there and you want to account for it, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, you need to make sure you're doing it appropriately, appropriately though. Now, um, what I mean by that is the rebar already being there is later on we're going to talk about shear design and, and particularly shear stirrups. Um, when we design shear stirrups, you're going to kind of get a, an idea about the, the entirety of the rebar within the, uh, within the beam. And you're going to see, all right, there's tensile reinforcement, there's the stirrups that resist shear, these, this small amount of rebar up top tends to help tie everything together. Um, that's number one. And number two, put, you actually do get a benefit on long-term deflections, which isn't going to make a lot of sense now. But uh, suffice it to say later on when we do deflection checks, um, having compression steel gives you a benefit. So we'll, we'll see that later. Now, um, from a capacity standpoint, we kind of do the same thing that we did with T-beams. We split it up into two couples, only now we're dealing with the couple generated by the force in the concrete and then the couple generated by the force in the steel. Also note the primes now, like if you're dealing with area of steel, A sub S is the area of the tensile reinforcement. A sub S prime is compressive reinforcement. D, your effective depth to the tensile reinforcement, D prime to the uh, steel or to the compressive reinforcement. Um, using similar triangles, uh, this is just, you know, it almost seems like it's on the side, but it's, it's really not. Using similar triangles, we can compute what the strain in that upper layer of steel is pretty easily. Um, that's not the, uh, the, 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 the hard part. The hard part is what happens when that strain is less than Fy. Okay. When we do our analysis, we're going to make an initial assumption that this steel yields. Okay. Now, we always make that assumption here because for two reasons. One, it almost always happens. And two, we, we have a strain limit within ACI anyways that says your strain has to be greater than or equal to 0 .004. And that's ACI's way of saying that this strain has to yield. So that's, uh, I mean, when you're given a, a generic beam, yeah, it's kind of an assumption, but it also has to, I mean, it, that has to be true, okay? But for the compression steel, for this steel in this upper layer, that's not necessarily the case. That steel does not have to yield, okay? And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. When it doesn't, the analysis gets a little trickier, okay? Now, if it has yielded, the force in that steel is just the area times Fy, and it's really simple. If it hasn't, then it's the, for, the area times some stress. How do you get that stress? Well, steel, as we assume, behaves linearly up until Fy. So if it hasn't yielded, then it's the area times some stress. How do you calculate that stress? E times the strain. How do you calculate the strain? Similar triangles. So your equilibrium expression, you know, setting C equals to T, gets a little nasty. Do a little bit of the algebra and rearranging it, you get a quadratic formula just to determine where your neutral axis is. Now, it's a very plug and chug and rote formula, but in the end, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Okay? Make sense? Okay. So we're going to do a couple examples. This is 10A and 10B. They're very similar except for the, um, the uh, FC prime changes from 10A to 10B and the compression steel changes. So we go from two number nines to two number sevens. 
So let's start off with 10A. I want to determine the capacity of this beam, the design flexural strength, the BMN. All right, we got four number 11s on the bottom, 6.25 inches squared, two number 9s on the top. Um, D for this beam is going to be 24 inches from the top to here. The, effect, or the, the D prime, however, from the top to the compression steel is two and a half inches. Okay? The beam is 14 inches wide, and that should be everything we need to, uh, to get started. Everybody good? Okay. Where'd my pen go? Okay. Okay, so to start off, just a couple things so that we have. Um, excuse me. FC prime is what, 3 KSI? What does that mean that beta 1 is? .85. It's .85 anytime this value is less than or equal to 4 KSI. Okay. Now, Fy is 60 KSI. Because of that, the strain at yield is Fy over E. What is E for steel? There we go. One of those values that my heart will be completely broken if you don't remember that by the time you get out of here. All right. Uh, 29,000 KSI under 60 KSI. And plug and chug, and this gives you 0 0.00207. Okay. And on and on. Okay. We need this value because we're going to make an assumption that the steel yields. We need to determine whether or not that assumption is valid by comparing the strain against that. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody good? All right. So I'm going to put assuming compression steel yields. So let me draw out the beam so that we all have an idea of what the beam looks like. So here's the beam. Okay. Now, what's the width of the beam? B equals what? Now, unlike before, we were, you know, we were just dealing with problems that had a layer of steel at the bottom. No, no, no. Now we also have a layer of steel at the top. Now up top, we're dealing with an AS prime of two square inches. On the bottom, we're dealing with 6.25. Okay. Now for some dimensions, This is D prime, and we'll take that to be 2.5 inches, right? Is that, that correct? And then this dimension here, take that to be D, that's 24 inches, okay? I'm making a point to draw the notation so that you all understand what these symbols mean, okay? Is everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. So the, what we need to do now is we need to consider equilibrium. In other words, C equals T. But I propose to you that we don't have just a compression force in the concrete and a compression force in the, or a tensile force in the steel. We've got two compressive forces. We have a compressive force in the concrete plus some 
compressive force in that steel up top, and that's got to equal the tensile force in the steel at the bottom. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Now, let's write this out. How do we calculate the compressive force in concrete? We say it's 0.85 Fc prime times the depth of our stress block times the width. What's the depth of our stress block? A, right? Right, remember we're trying to determine, you know, how much of that concrete is in compression. My best at shading things without Stop blotting out those letters. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Compressive force in the concrete, 0.85 Fc prime AB. Now, how do we calculate the compressive force in the steel? This is where that assumption comes into play, that we are assuming that the steel yields. So it's just the area of steel prime times Fy. And I propose to you that that's got to equal the tensile force. Is everybody okay with that? Again, making an assumption. That assumption is right here. The fact that we said it's the area times Fy. Everybody good? So what do we not know in this equation? A. So would you believe me if I said that A is the following? So if I subtract that over, divide, I'm going to have the following. All right. So I subtract that over, and then I've got a common Fy, so I factor that out, and then divide by 0.85 Fc prime B, I've got A. Is everybody okay with that? So plug and chug. What are we getting? There we go, yeah. Oh, yep. Good catch. I can tell because you have the same thing I do. All right. Now. Let's make sure everybody's on the same page. We made an assumption that the steel up top yields, okay? And in order to check that assumption, we need the strain. So I'm going to walk through that, okay? So first off, we've got A, okay? How do we calculate the neutral axis depth? It's A divided by what? Beta 1, which is 7.143 inches divided by... 0.85. So that is 0.85. Excuse me. That is this. All right. Everybody good? Can I break away from a second? Or for a, for a quick second? All right. So let me go back to the slides to show you something. Now, 
I gave you this on purpose. This is the how you would calculate the strain up top. Okay, it's still similar triangles, but I figured I'd just give you the formula instead of d minus c. It's c minus d prime because you're looking above, not below. Okay, so that's where the sign change comes from. All right. All right. Um, so let's calculate some strains. Let's start off with the strain up top. Minus what's D prime? Now somebody tell me what you get. So 0 0.00211, would that be a fair, oh goodness, wrapped around the keyboard there. All right, everybody else, you getting the same thing? What does this mean? What does that mean? That it's shielded because it's greater than epsilon sub y which is 0 0.00207. So our original assumption was valid, okay? We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay. While we're at it, and since we're in the habit of computing strains, why don't we go ahead and compute the strain in the bottom? So 0 0.003 D minus C over C, which is 0 0.003, what's D? D is 24 inches. Be, okay, hold on. Well, let, let me put it like this, okay? You could, if you wanted to do D minus C and then D prime minus C, you could do that. This would come out negative, okay? I just rewrote it that way. I, I think it's a little easier to see, okay, this is a compression strain. This is a tensile strain. That's just the way I remember it. So, if I was, let me put it like this. If I was doing this, like if I, if I was writing a software program, I would probably just have it do this across the board. Anytime I got a negative answer, I would know I was dealing with compressive strains as opposed to tensile strains. Okay, so plug and chug this one, what do you get? There we go. So what does this mean? Well, it, it, the tensile still yielded, but we knew that, that, like, that had to be the case. What else does it mean? There we go, okay. It's greater than 0 0.005, so that means that phi is 0 0.9, okay. Th does that make sense? So the strain in, com the steel strain in compression, the strain up here, told us that our original assumption about the steel yielding was valid. The strain down here, told us that phi was in fact 0.9. Sound good? All right, give, give me one moment because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get lazy here. Uh, I'm going to use this diagram again in the not too distant future.
Okay. So we know phi is 0.9. Now all that's left for us to do is to compute mn. So let's look at our nominal moment capacity. All right. So I'm going to treat it like the T-beam that we did before. Remember we computed a compressive force in the flange and a compressive force in the web? Well, I'm going to compute a compressive force in the concrete and a compressive force in this upper layer of steel. Now let's start off with the compressive force in the concrete. How do I compute the compressive force in the concrete? We've already written this out before. 0.85 FC prime AB. We, we did that earlier, right? So 0.85 FC prime AB, which is 0 0.85 times 3 KSI, I'll make that mistake again, times A, which A was like what, 7.143 inches, and this was 14 inches. If you track all your decimals and plug and chug, it actually comes out to exactly 255 kits. Now, I can tell you, how you can make that determination. What is the compressive force in the upper layer of steel? AS times what? AS prime times what? FY. We made the assumption that it had yielded and we found that was valid. Now what you've got here is 2 square inches times 60 KSI. That's going to be 120 kips. Now here's a check to make sure you're doing everything right. What is this? And that equals this plus this. So that's a check that at least your original math was, was correct. And you can actually do all the decimals to see that this will, or tra if you track all your decimals, you'll see that this comes out to be exactly 255 because this has to equal that minus that. All right. Now, I wanted this little image of the beam here because I wanted to be able to write a moment expression while looking at the cross-section. So, MN, okay? We're going to do the same trick that we did before, okay? We're going to sum moments from the tensile layer of steel. So, we're going to have a compressive force in the concrete times some moment arm plus the compressive force in that upper layer of steel times some moment arm. So you all are going to help me with this, okay? If I'm summing moments here, how do I get from this layer of steel to the center of this compressive force in the concrete? You tell me. D minus A over 2. We go up D, go down half of A, and there we go. So D minus A over 2. Now that's the upper layer, or that's the concrete. What about that upper layer of steel? How do I get from here to there? That upper layer of steel. D minus D prime. There you go. So. All right. So now we can plug and chug, so we get 255 kips. 24 inches minus 7 point. One, four, three inches over two. Oh, gotta add that. All right, if you do all the math, plugging and chugging, that will give you. 77.89.3 inch kips. 
Okay. Now divide that by 12. It's going to give you 649.11 foot kips. Is that our final answer? We want FEMN. And how do we calculate FEMN? We take MN and multiply it by phi, which is 0.9. So 0 0.9, 649.11 foot kips. VMN What do you think? This is a simple one because the steel yielded. Okay. Again, crystal ball, what's going to happen on 10B? The steel isn't going to yield, so we'll see what happens. So far, so good? Okay. Let's look at the next one. Okay. So this problem, if you look at the example, it's, fair, it's literally the exact same geometry. The only change is the concrete got a little stronger, and if I'm correct, the compression steel got a little smaller, right? Was that? OK, all right. So I'm going to go through this example, or at least the beginning stages of this example, a little faster, OK? So you all have the diagram right in front of you, so I think I can, I can do that. So we'll start off, we'll assume that the compression steel yields. All right. So we get that the compression force in the concrete plus the compression force in that upper layer of steel has to equal the tensile force generated in that lower layer of steel. And that's 0 0.85 FC prime AB plus the area of steel in compression times an assumed stress of FY equals AS FY. So therefore, A is AS minus AS prime FY 0.85 FC prime B, which equals, what do we got? The area of the, the, the tensile steel changed as well, didn't it? Well, it's, it's four number tens, right? So it's 5.06 oh, minus two number sevens, which is Okay, is everybody see, did I go too fast or are you all good? Y'all good? Okay. So plug and chug, that gives you 4.866. All right. Since we've got an A value, I might as well go ahead and compute the neutral axis depth, C, which is A over beta 1 which it's four KSI concrete, so we're still dealing with a beta one of 0.85, right? So 4.866, 5.724, and then the strain.
C is 5.724 minus D prime is still two and a half inches, right? Again, it's the same physical geometry, it's just different material properties in different steel areas. Okay, and you plug and chug, and that's going to give you 0 0.00169. Okay, so what does that mean? The st compression steel does not yield. So this is where we start to answer Mr. Stack's question. This is less than or equal to epsilon sub y assumption was in valid. compression steel doesn't yield. I'm going to give you all a little bit to catch up because I want to make sure you all are aware of what I do next. So far, so good? Okay. Does everybody have all this written out? Okay. Because I'm such a nice guy, I derived this for you. Okay. So again, we're dealing with a situation where C equals T, but the upper layer of steel hasn't yielded. So if that's the case, we're not dealing with just the area of steel times Fy. It's area of steel times the stress, which is E times the strain, which is E times all of this. So if you multiply everything out and then collect everything accordingly, you're going to get the following quadratic equation. Okay? So the way I've done this for you is there is a bracketed term plus a bracketed term minus a bracketed term. I'm going to include this negative to keep everything consistent because I think it's a little easier on, on the, uh, the sign conventions. Okay, so everybody see this? Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm going to say we now have to do an equilibrium check using a quadratic equation. Okay, so bear with me. I'm going to do my best to keep the signs consistent. Okay, so let's start off with that first bracketed term. And what was it? It was 0 0.85 FC prime beta 1 times B. Am I correct? So that's 0 0.85 times FC prime of 4 KSI times 0 0.85 times 14 inches. And if you plug and chug, that's going to equal 40.46. Now, technically it's kips per inch, but everything that I'm going to do in this set of calcs has consistent units anyway, so I'm just going to be a little loose and leave the units off. But I put all the, you know, intro count, you know, the inner, you know, input values is KSI inches to make sure it's consistent. But you'll see what I'm doing here in a second. Everybody with me? Okay. The next term inside of a bracket is, okay, what is it? AS prime ES 0 0.003 minus AS FY. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Plug and chug. What's AS prime? If y'all tell me what to write. There we go. E
There we go, 29,000 KSI. Again, y'all gonna break my heart if you don't remember that one. 0 0.003 minus 5.06 times 60 KSI. So again, consistent units going in. I'm not really too concerned with the units coming out, although technically the units coming out will be kits. I want somebody to do this math and tell me what you get. Yes, we are. That, that was based on our assumption. Keep in mind, that was based on this A value, which we computed assuming the compression steel yielded, and we found that it was wrong. That's good. You get a negative number. That's fine, okay? That's fine that you'll get a negative number. That's okay. And did you get, like, negative 199? There we go. Okay. Is everybody okay with this? The third term, you know how that negative was on the outside of the brackets? I'm going to go ahead and distribute that and say that we have negative AS prime ES 0.003 D prime. So this is going to give us a negative number as well. So negative 1.2 inches squared, 29,000 KSI. What'd you get here? What do you get here? Negative 87,000? Probably the 2.5 or, or, or 0 .003, yeah. I get 261, negative 261. Okay, so negative 261. Okay, so are you fine with these three numbers? Okay, I'm even going to box them. Everybody okay with this? I propose to you that therefore your quadratic expression is 40.46c squared minus 199.2 C minus 261 equals zero. And that's what you solved. I've got to believe that you all can solve an equation like that, am I correct? That was like sixth grade, seventh grade, something like that? That you all did that? What's that? somewhere around there. You learned it in the public school system. You learned it by Calc 2, okay? So. <laughs> so you should get two answers. And what, what two answers are you going to get? Somebody help me out. Right? Everybody else getting that? All right. So, therefore, C is 5.999 inches. And I'm using that. I mean, I could probably round it to 6 and be fine, but I'm just going to use that value to be consistent. Does everybody understand that? Everybody okay with that? All right. Can I go on to the next page or do you all need some time?
All right. So I'll say let's let's go ahead to keep this simple. Let's go ahead and do our uh, our strength reduction factor. or B. Since we've got C, C is 5.999 inches, therefore the strain in that lower layer of steel is 0 0.003 D minus C over C, which is, what is that? It's um, 0 0.003 times, what's D? 24 inches? And that comes out to be 0 0.009. So what does that mean? V is 0.9. Okay. Our nominal moment capacity Before I go through and do this nominal moment capacity, keep in mind that those equations that we used before, they still work except for the compressive force in the concrete. We've got to do a little bit of work for that. Now, while I'm at it, since I know I'm going to use it, I'm going to go ahead and calculate A. Now, how am I going to calculate A if I've got C? There you go, beta 1C. That comes out to be five, about 5.1 inches. Okay. All right. Sound good? Now, the compressive force in the concrete is 0 0.85 FC prime AB, which is 0 0.85 times 4 KSI times 5.099 inches times B, and B is what, 14? Sound good? Okay, you plug and chug, you're going to get 242.71. Now, the compressive force in that upper layer of steel, though, do we take the area of steel and multiply it times Fy? No, because the steel didn't yield. Okay? You have to take the area of steel times the stress, which is E times the strain. So you have to go through and say the area of steel times E times 0.003. C minus D prime over C. Oh, yep, yeah, sorry, forgot my prime. Thank you. So that's, so the A prime is 1.2. E is 29,000. Plug it up, and that'll give you about 60. .89. Now, what's our check that we've been using? C equals T, right? What is this plus that equal to?
The area of steel is 5.06. Don't have a marker, so we'll go for eraser drop. It really is Monday, isn't it? So this is your check that C equals T, okay? Add these two up, you're going to get 303.6, calculate T. This is just a check to see that what you're doing is right, okay? I know there's a lot of involved math that goes into this. Okay, so therefore... We have MN. Now, the expression that we used before, it was like C, C, D minus A over 2 plus C, S prime, D minus D prime. That still works because the forces and their moment arms are still in the same spots. It's not like anything moved just because the steel yielded or didn't yield. So this is 242.71. And then plug and chug that, you're going to get, uh, let's see, Ooh. 6, 5, 1, 5.4 inch kips, which calculates to 542.95 foot kips. All right, so that's MN. We've got phi, right? Phi is 0.9. So I propose to you that phi MN is, just take that, multiply it times 0.9. And there you go. Now, does anybody have any questions? All right. With this, you should be able to do everything that you need to complete homework four. That's number one. Number two. We're not going to worry about designing doubly reinforced beams. I'm more interested in your ability to analyze them. Number three, we are done with bending moment, period. We're done. So we have our next major beam force effect to deal with next. We've done moment. Next time we will look at shear, okay? Afterwards, we do deflection, and then it's funny how that's all there is to say about beams. So, all right, that's all I got for you all. I will see you all next time.